Welcome to Baseball Biz. I'm Mark Carpenter, your host, and with me today, we have a very special guest. That is Professor Brad Snyder. Brad Snyder, Georgetown Law Professor. He teaches constitutional law and history, sports law, which obviously here at Baseball Biz we're interested in. He's author of several books. A couple of them that really captured my attention was one, A Well-Paid Slave, about Kurt Flood and his fight to get through to free agency and what happened and didn't happen with that. Another book that Brad has written is Beyond the Shadow of, of the Senators, about the Homestead Grays and some baseball integration is that. And most recently, Democratic Justice, about Felix Frankfurter from the Supreme Court. Welcome. Glad to have you here, Brad. How's it going, man? Mark, thanks for having me. It's it's great to be here and it's great to talk about Kurt. I, I never get tired of talking about him and his lawsuit and, and what he did for all the professional sports because it, it just each year just continues to resonate. Um, you know, I, it's it's amazing. It's been almost 50 years uh, since that decision came down, um, and, and here we are still talking about Kurt Flood. I didn't know in 2006 when I wrote this book that, you know, people would still be interested in talking about him. You know, it's it's amazing to me. Well, a lot of what he did impacted what with free agency that came later, and also even today's world, we're looking at MLB and the Players Association trying to come together on a collective bargaining agreement, updating that, whatever that may be. So I think it's very timely. And Kurt Flood's passage, his journey, I think, really kind of tells that tale. And folks, as Brad was mentioning, this is a lot of this is over 50 years ago. So if you're a baseball fan, you may already know about Kurt Flood. But if you don't, a couple of things you should know. Kurt was in, let's see, oh, started up, I think about, was it um, 1956? He started in the majors with the Cincinnati Reds. Then he did 12 years with the St. Louis Cardinals. And then we'll talk about what happened after that. But while just taking a look from 1963 to 69, this man was amazing. Seven times Golden Glove winner, six times MVP. And if I look over the 12 years at St. Louis, what well, he had a batting average about 293. And my gosh, uh, let's see, on base percentage of 343 and 633. RBIs. So that's the statistics on this man. But there's a whole lot more. And Brad, can can you give us a little bit more insight on on Kurt Flood, the man? Yeah, he he is a really sort of cerebral, um, complicated guy, right? He was really interested in art. Um, he was really interested in politics. And, and um, I, I think for for me and this book, and, and the reason why I wrote it was um, why would somebody give up? his major league baseball career that most people would kill to play in the big leagues, right? Oh yeah. Oh, Why yeah. would somebody throw it all away to sue in a lawsuit that Marvin Miller, the head of the players association told him, this is a million to one shot. Even if that million to one shot comes home, you're never going to see a dime. Right. And Kurt said, will it benefit future players? And Miller said, yes. Right. And, and Kurt said, well, that's good enough for me. And the reason why I wrote the book was, what makes somebody want to do that, right? I mean, he had at least three or four years of a major league career left. And um, and he left hundreds of thousands of dollars on the table to do this. And so, you know, what I was trying to answer is, what is it about him that, that made him want to do this to benefit others? And I, I think that the short answer is the civil rights movement. He, he really, um, when he went in 1956, he's from Oakland, California. And, and and was on played on integrated American Legion teams um, with Asian players, with white players, and, and you know really the the color Oakland was kind of a polyglot community uh, of um, you know Southern black migrants, Asian immigrants, whites, right? So there was a lot of you know Latinos. There was a lot of diversity there, right? But he goes to his first spring training with the Cincinnati Reds in Florida and he shows up at the team hotel to check in and, and they quickly shoo him out of the hotel, right. And say, you, you can't be here. And they send him to the boarding house where all the black players were. And, and you know, that was a real culture shock for him to see you know, separate drinking fountains in, in, in Florida and, and, and to experience kind of, you know, Southern style segregation for the first time as an 18 year old kid. And it, you know, it just kind of got worse for him, right? So he spent that his first um, year of Major League Baseball was um, in the Carolina League, 
at High Point in Thomasville, where he just experienced horrible things, um, you know, traveling throughout the Carolina League, um, places he couldn't go, restaurants he couldn't go. He couldn't even um, launder his clothes with his teammates' clothes, right? He had to put his clothes in a separate pile. And, and you know, the next year, he was in the Sally League um, in Savannah, and it was worse. And, and, and I think what those two years did was it was kind of a trial by fire, and, and it really kind of a radicalized is really the, the wrong word, but what it made him to was sensitive to injustice. And he was sort of living um, the, the civil rights movement. And, and then um, he started to stand up for himself. You know, as he got into the major leagues um, in 1961, he and his teammates on the St. Louis Cardinals integrated spring training hotel in, in St. Petersburg, Florida, of all places, right? And, and, you know, they just took a stand. And then the next year in 62, Jackie Robinson, who's, you know, by this point retired from the game, but asked Kirk to go down to Mississippi, right, to to um, to speak at an NAACP rally. Well, this was no small ask, right? That was a, you know, Kurt was l- risking his life to go down to Jackson. He was um, being trailed by, yeah. you know, state um, law enforcement officials undercover. His host was Medgar, Medgar Evers, who's, six months later was shot and killed by, you know, a Klansman, right? So, you know, this was the sort of radicalization and and sensitivization of of him. And then I think the big move was after the Cardinals won the World Series in 1964, Kurt tried to move into a white neighborhood in in Alamo, California, and Walnut Creek. This wasn't just a Southern thing. This was, you know, an American problem, um, racism. And and, um, he, he goes to move into this house and a uh, the owner of the house finds out that a black man's going to move into the house and, and threatens him with a shotgun, says, I'll gun you down and your family if you move into this house. Well, he got a court order and armed police protection to move into that house. Right. And, and um, you know, so this was somebody who, by this point in his career, r- realized that, that things weren't fair in America and was willing to take a stand. And, and uh, so it, it's not a surprise to me, given all that happened to him as he became a star. And I'd say Kurt was a star, but not a superstar, as you kind of laid out, right? He was, you know, seven-time Gold Glover, three-time All-Star, you know, a very important player on a perennial World Series team, right? You know, just below that $100,000 mark that superstars get, right? And then he gets traded. And then he, and then he sues baseball and kind of changes the world. Well, he was kind of infuriated when he got traded from Cincinnati to St. Louis in the first place. I mean, that right. he, he was already paint, painting from that. And that stuck with him, even though he was in St. Louis and had, had 12 years, which I think he enjoyed. I mean, he even opened a business there and photography. He had a, a family. You know, you make connections, man. And and he was doing great. But he yeah, also- you're totally right. You're totally right, Mark. I just let, let's just like, can we I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that, no, that's such do. a great point. Um, because people overlook that trade from Cincinnati to um, to St. Louis, and even I do somewhat. But, you know, Kurt was their top minor league prospect. They traded him from Cincinnati to St. Louis for nothing, basically. Um, and, and the reason why they did it was because they already had his two buddies from Oakland, Frank Robinson and Veda Pinson, in the outfield in an all-black outfield in Cincinnati in 1958 just wasn't going to work. Right. Right. And, 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 but you are totally right. You know, that, that, that trade was bad. And then the second point made it even better. There's nothing better than being a baseball star with the St. Louis Cardinals because they have the best fan base. That city is wild about baseball. They always have been. Um, you can do no wrong if you are a world series winning ball player in, in St. Louis. I mean, look at Ozzy Smith. Like he's still oh, like yeah. the king of St. Louis, right? There's just no better place. You know, they just, you become a part of the community. And I think that's still true today. And that's why you see St. Louis attract ball players and they stay, right? Pe- players want to play in St. Louis. Um, I, I think of it as Boston without the angst and the edge, right? You know, you don't, you, you, you have all this, these nice fans, right? So I, I, you're totally right. You know, so getting traded from the St. Louis Cardinals, which happened on October 7th, 1969 to Kurt, right, to the Philadelphia Phillies, who were the considered the worst team to yeah. play for in the major leagues at the time, 
right? Especially for African-American players, right? Because they had known how the Philadelphia fans had treated Dick Allen, who Kurt was traded for, you know, several years before. Right. So, you know, the, you know, and his friend, um, Bill White, was on the Phillies. He told him, like, this is not a good place to play. This is not St. Louis, right? This is not a either a first-class organization or a city that's hospitable to black players. So all of those things were going on when he said, I'm not going to Philadelphia. You, it doesn't matter that you offered me close to $100,000 um, in salary. I'm not going, right? I'm going to sue this idea of teams owning players for life and then trading them to other teams who then own their players for life, um, you know, is wrong, right? And that, that's kind of amazing for, for one player to kind of take on the establishment right like that. It's so mm -hmm. rare for players to do. I mean, the last one recently is Kaepernick, right? And I think um, we can talk about the parallels, but but the, I think, you know, Kaepernick and Flood have some some things in common. Well, Flood, as you mentioned earlier on, too, was an intelligent man who, who continued to read, who continued, who was involved with the arts. And, you know, he, and he was a sensitive man, too. He was where some people might not pay attention to the pinpricks that became deep cuts. He saw them early on and he responded to them. And that whole idea of when the Cardinals said, you know, it's time to go ahead and trade you, Kurt. And there was a couple of things that they said. One was that, uh, I think, what was it, a playoff game the year before? You know, he, he had a foible out there. It's like, yeah, we're going to go ahead and cancel you for that one foible, okay? But then he also had some issues with uh, his business and a brother of his who did, I think, armed robbery or at least robbery. And yes. those kind of things put a stigma above and beyond the racism that was already always there uh, with Kurt. So uh, one more thing, just kind of jump back for a second, too. I think the detachment of ownership, you know, was was so, let's see, problematic at best, okay? And I, a moment you have in your book that crystallizes that for me is when uh, Bush, the uh, owner of the Cardinals, and he's talking to Kurt, and he kind of realizes, oh, you're not, you're not being housed with the rest of the guys while you're down here in spring training. You're, you're having to sit down there. Good Lord, man. Now, it, one, I was glad Bush saw that and he tried to do something about it. But two, it told me about the complete detachment that the ownership has of what's going on in their players' lives. But yeah, you know, I think if the Cardinals had, had to do all over again, they they could have avoided this lawsuit, right? If they had come to Kurt and said, hey. We have this opportunity to trade you, but we realize you're the longest tenured member on our team, right? You've had 12 years. There's no player on the Cardinals with who've been on the team for longer. Where would you like to go? Yeah, yeah. Right? And, you know, if they had said, and, and obviously Kurt would have said L.A. or San Francisco because he's from the West Coast, right? Um, and, and I think if they had tried to accommodate him, but rather than, and they didn't even have the general manager call him or the owner call him, but to have a guy that Kurt didn't respect call him early in the morning yeah right after the news had really broke i think all of those things contributed like you're trading me like a piece of of cattle i think all of those things exacerbated the situation and then you're right to bring up kurt's history with gutsy bush you know he, he started to have a rocky relationship with the owner so what's really hard to understand today mark for especially for young people is the owners had so much power over the players and, and players who spoke out got traded, right? And Kurt started to make noise about his salary before the 1969 season and he held out, which is the only way a player could increase his salary right. is by holding out and basically not reporting to spring training. And that ticked off Gussie Bush. His batting average went down to 285 in 69, but you know, if you start making waves with the owner, you end up on another team. Joe Torrey, who was Kurt's teammate, got traded by Paul Richards from and the Braves for um, becoming an outspoken member of the union, right? Um, I think Willie Mays got traded. Frank Robinson got traded. Hank Aaron got traded, right? Guys get traded, right? And the only way superstars don't get traded is by kind of kowtowing to the owner. And, and, you know, really by like becoming the owner's sort of buddy. And, and, you know, that's what's really hard to understand is there was such an imbalance of power 
right? We can't even fathom it now because players are so much more empowered, right? They, they don't have to um, just walk the company line. They can say what they want to say on Twitter or social media <laughs> and, and not, and not with, with a few exceptions, right? But most of the time, a player can say something on social media and not worry about getting traded. I don't want to get into that too much, but I got to tell you, when I was reading this book, social media kept popping up to my head. I thought, what would have been different? What would have happened? Maybe nothing, but <laughs> it would have been out there. And, it, and since baseball was even more popular than it is today, I, I can only see a firestorm going across social media when, when this happened. But well, you, I think Kurt, but I think, Mark, it's an important point that you're raising. I think Kurt could have controlled the message better on social media, right? He could have tweeted out his own letter, right? I'm not a, a piece of property to, to be bought and sold irrespective of my wishes, which is the letter that he sent the commissioner on December 24th, 1969. And, you know, when he goes on Howard Cosell in January of 1970 and Howard Cosell says, who's sympathetic to Kurt, says, you know, Kurt, $90,000 a year, those aren't exactly slave wages. And he says a well-paid slave is not um, ex- is, is nonetheless a slave, which is how I got the title of my book, right? I just think if Kurt had social media at his disposal, he would have been able to control the narrative a little better, right? Okay. You know, the, the, the kind of the way that, that LeBron James is able to control um, how he is portrayed, right? Um, and I, I look at James as like the culmination of everything Kurt's done as a player who's totally empowered, right? Who has more power than the league itself in the sense that, like he can control which team he plays for. He's very outspoken on social and political issues, and he uses social media as kind of his megaphone. Um, you know, I think that's a reflection of what Kurt's done for all athletes. I think that's important what you said. It's a reflection of what he's done for all athletes. And and coming back to where a lot of that started, one, we said something briefly about his tr- his trade from the Reds to St. Louis. But when that came Back in was it, I guess sixty eight or sixty nine, you know, Flood, he's a man of conviction. In, in a sense, I'm looking here too. You were mentioning Cosell. He's kind of surrounded by lawyers. He's got Marvin Miller. He's got uh, Coon, Boogie Coon. And I didn't realize until I read your book that Cosell was also a lawyer. So there's people who can see the machinations of what's actually rotating around Kurt. Uh, I want to read that letter that Kurt sent to Boogie Coon on December twenty fourth, nineteen sixty nine. I, I tell you, I can't help but think of this letter every time around Christmas time because of that. And let's see, here's this letter from your book I'm reading. Dear Mr. Kuhn, after 12 years in the major leagues, I do not feel that I am a piece of property be, to be bought and sold irrespective of my wishes. I believe that any system which produces that result violates my basic rights as a citizen and is inconsistent with the laws of the United States and of the several states. It is my desire to play in 1970, and I'm capable of playing. I have received a contract offer from the Philadelphia club, but I believe I have the right to consider offers from other clubs before making any decisions. I therefore request that you make known to all major league clubs my feelings in this matter and advise them of my availability for the 1970 season. Sincerely yours, Kurt Flood. Bam. (laughs) <laughs> let's let's start the let's start what's going to happen. This is, I think, the cannonball that made everybody awake. And what came after that? Now, I know some of the things too is won't get too much into that, but about the backing of the players, he got some backing because Marvin Miller, who was just there at the beginning of the Major League Baseball Players Association, as far as a union was concerned, was looking at backing from players in what a meeting they had, I think, in Puerto Rico, and. But let's let's talk about give me a little bit of what you see is what happened after Kurt wrote this letter. Yeah, I think that Puerto Rico meeting, Mark, is really important. I mean, what what, what Miller and, and his his counsel were doing and Marvin's not a lawyer, um, but but his and it, but Thank Miller you. and his no, no, no. But um, but Miller's what Miller was doing was putting the league on notice. Right. Like either you let Kurt negotiate with the team of his choice and rescind the trade to Philadelphia or we're going to sue. That's the unstated portion of this letter. Once Kurt's determined to sue, he needs the backing of the Players Association. And that's why the Puerto Rico meeting is so important. 
And the Puerto Rico meeting is the annual meeting of the Players Association where all of the player representatives come. And Kurt spoke to that meeting of player representatives. And it really was a who's who of ball players, right? You had um, a young superstar in Reggie Jackson as the A's player rep. You had the um, Pittsburgh Pirates, Roberto Clemente in that room. You had, you know, the player reps tend to be the most respected guys and, and the more intelligent guys on the team. Right. Right. And, um, and, but Kurt needed the backing of the Players Association because he knew he couldn't fund this litigation. As you sort of alluded to earlier, his business in St. Louis, um, his photography business and, and portrait business was in trouble, right? His business interests were in trouble uh, and he owed alimony. And he, 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 even though he was a professional athlete, he had problems financially. And, and Miller knew that he couldn't fund the lawsuit. And, and so they needed the approval of the player rep. And a couple of the player reps said, hey, is this a black power thing, right? Tom Haller of the St. Louis, San Francisco Giants says, hey, is this a black power thing? And, and Kurt said, no, this isn't a black thing or a white thing. This is a player freedom thing, there you go. right? You know, and, 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 and you know, I, he won over everybody. It was unanimous to, to fund Kurt's lawsuit. And, and the, the, the bargain for Kurt, though, was we'll fund your lawsuit, but we get to pick the lawyer. Right. And here's where Marvin Miller, who is probably the smartest player um, union head ever, yeah. made uh, one of a few mistakes and he admitted it. But he hired Arthur Goldberg, who he had worked with in the Steel Workers Union, who was a former Supreme Court justice and secretary of labor to be Flood's counsel. And um, it was a, it turned out to be a huge mistake because Miller, I mean, Goldberg was past his prime as a lawyer. And he had other things in mind that he wanted to do. He wanted to be governor of New York. Uh, and, and he wasn't the right person to be the face of the lawsuit. Um, but th be that as it may, that players union meeting was, was important because it put all of the players in kind of a symbolic way behind Kurt. Even though all of them weren't behind Kurt, at least all of the player representatives um, were behind Kurt. Right. Right. And, and that that was really important um, be, because that meant that the union stood behind him. This was a union funded lawsuit. Right. Kurt was not on, out there on his own. That is, by the way, Mark, one thing that makes it is different than Colin Kaepernick, where there was some tension between Colin Kaepernick and the NFLPA. Right. And, and, and I think Kaepernick felt like the NFLPA was were, was not fighting for him here. Marvin Miller and the Players Association were fighting for Kurt 100% of the way, even though I don't think the union was ready for, for this, to put all of its chips in the center of the table and for this lawsuit. Um, they were, the union was behind him 100%. And that speaks well of Marvin Miller and the union. Absolutely. And to, to be able to get that kind of you know, unanimous consensus to back him on that, I, I was astounded, actually, in that day and age. But... I'm also glad they addressed, oh, is this a black power thing? No, this is treating a man, a player, as they should be treated as a man. You know, whatever other things you want to put on top of it, that's somebody else. Here's what it is. And when we talk about Marvin Miller and we talk about Kurt and we talk about the union at this point, I think what they were all looking for was a commitment. And by that, I mean, Marvin Miller says, hey, Kurt, what? We may not win this thing. As a matter of fact, I don't expect to win this thing. And as you were talking about earlier, I'm thinking about the old, what is it, story about planting a tree whose shade you would never be able to sit under. And I'm thinking he knows what he is doing for those players today and in the future. And during the time while all this is going on, he doesn't really have any income. I mean, that money that the Players Association pulled together is going to go for his legal defense. You, you don't see any of those players really coming up and say, hey, Kurt, hey, do you need a few thousand dollars to help you get over? Hey, Kurt, you know. I'm glad you're doing all this for us. We we can help you out. I, I'm making I'm a player making a hundred thousand dollars right now, but none of that happens. And and when he goes to federal court, all while all of those people sanctioned everything that said we're going to be behind you, Kurt. There were none of them in the courtroom. Yeah, that was the other really big mistake of Marvin Miller's was not having the players as a. And he told me this personally when I spoke with him numerous times. The two biggest mistakes he made was one hiring Arthur Goldberg and two, not having players when they um, came to play the Mets or the Yankees show up at, at Kurt's trial um, uh, to show some solidarity 
because only three people associated with the game um, testified on Kurt's behalf. And they were kind of all on the outside looking in at that point. Um, Jackie Robinson, Hank Greenberg, um, and Bill Vec, um, right? But but you're totally right. Kurt was out out on a limb financially. And what he really needed to do, Mark, during this lawsuit was declare bankruptcy, Yeah. right? And he couldn't, and, and he got to the point where um, after the trial in about 1971, he needed to declare bankruptcy um, and, and sort of start over because he was just hemorrhaging money. And he couldn't because his biggest asset was the lawsuit. And if he had declared bankruptcy, he would have that 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 lawsuit was an asset. He would have had to, the receiver in the bankruptcy would have settled that lawsuit on oh. Kurt's behalf. He knew he couldn't settle. And so he just kept going. Right. Even though it was against his own financial interest. Right. He knew he had to see it all the way through to the Supreme Court of the United States because that was the only way they were going to win. Well, and it's something that debt could have actually killed this whole thing. You know, his, his personal debt could have, could have killed all this. Let's talk for a moment about when they went to federal court. There's a couple of things that are being contested. One of them is what is it, federal baseball. Uh, we're looking at reserve clauses. We're looking at uh, what the antitrust exemptions. Give me, now I'm talking broadly. Bring in a little more closely. What yeah, is actually Let me addressed. explain a few things. First of all, the reserve clause is is a is something in the contract mm -hmm. right it's a it's a, and and it, it's basically says we own you for this year and we own you for next year too and what would happen at the end of every season is the players would sign a new contract and so if you're owned for this year and you're owned for next year too then you're you can never get out of that contract and negotiate with the team of your your choice that's what um, the reserve clause is it's really more of a reserve system because the teams also have lists of players that they are reserving, right? So, but but basically it is a system of perpetual ownership of the players. Unlike any other major league sport, baseball was exempt from, and that's a that that sort of reserve system is an antitrust violation. It's a it's a group boycott, which is a per se violation of the antitrust laws. It's a and it's basically in non-legal language an illegal monopoly. Baseball was running an illegal monopoly, right? And the reason why and Kurt wanted to sue baseball over the reserve clause as an illegal monopoly. If it were any other sport, if it were football, if it were basketball, if it were hockey, he would have won. But in 1922, Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote a unanimous decision that said baseball was not interstate commerce based on the facts of the game at the time, and therefore not subject to the antitrust law. Now, this problem gets compounded by a decision in 1953 when Earl Warren had just joined the court, where they, uh, they really rewrite what Holmes said, because all Holmes really said was, hey, in 1922, there's not much radio, there's no TV, there's no minor league system. I don't really see this interstate commerce going on i just see games in various cities right the travel he says is incidental and holmes doesn't know anything about baseball but certainly by 1953 with the minor leagues with radio with television baseball's interstate commerce but the warren court really misreads holmes's opinion as not a factual one but as kind of a interpretation of the law and, and what the, what they said in a case called toolson was that Congress in 1890, when it passed the Sherman Antitrust Act, intended to exempt baseball, but it did nothing of the of the sort, right? So now you get to 1970, you've got two Supreme Court decisions exempting baseball, but no other sports because football came calling and the Supreme Court said, sorry. Boxing came calling, the Supreme Court said, sorry. Only baseball is exempt from the antitrust laws. This is why Marvin Miller said it was a million to one shot, because you have to overturn two Supreme Court decisions yeah. to win. And he just thought, look, you're not going to get a court to do that. And that's why the federal district court eventually dismissed Kurt's lawsuit, because you have two Supreme Court decisions saying baseball is exempt from the antitrust law. Yes. At least so the federal one. The federal now, Mar Right. Arthur Goldberg had a tricky argument up his sleeve. He said, Look, if this is not interstate commerce, 
then it's intrastate commerce, then it should be subject to the state antitrust laws. So he also sued the major leagues under um, New York's antitrust laws as well. So there was that component of it. They also sued under the 13th Amendment and said these are badges and incidents of slavery. So there were all those things going on in the lawsuit, um, but really on that federal antitrust issue is what went up to the Supreme Court. So the merits of the case, whether the reserve clause was an was an illegal monopoly, that was never reached right. because of these preliminary issues. And um, you think about it, mean, you, you mentioned earlier, it came from uh, Holmes back in 1922. So here we are 100 years later, and there's, there's still parts of that that are sticking with us. I, I can't think of the exact phrase for in legal lease, but it's basically let it stand. And yeah, stare decisis, right? It's what everybody's talking about with the abortion cases, right? Which is the only reason why baseball is exempt from the antitrust laws is because of stare decisis, which is we're going to just rely on our past decisions, even if they're wrong, right? You know, and, and I think the court knew when Kurt's lawsuit got to the Supreme Court in 1972 that Toulson, the 1953 case was wrong. But it said, look, we're not going to do anything about it. Even though we created this mess, we're not going to do anything about it. We're going to leave it up to Congress. Well, Congress is not going to do anything for a variety of complicated reasons. But 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 the, the this was a problem that the court created, right? There is nothing in the Sherman Antitrust Act that says baseball is the only professional sport that shouldn't be subject to it. It's an accident of history. And you're right, today baseball is still the only professional sport exempt from the antitrust laws. And that just blows my mind. I, I can't, you know, every now and then, like they should kick it back to Congress was one of the things that the Supreme Court was saying. And I know what, the, what happened in Atlanta this past year. And they'll be saying, hey, we're going to move to the All-Star game. And some congressmen said, hey, you know what? We should look at this antitrust thing, the ones that were upset. Well, yeah. It was a threat. Well, yeah, they, <laughs> there's still, there was some legislation introduced um, to remove baseball's antitrust exemption. And then you know, it's not as far fetched as it seems. You know, the NCAA um, just had a, a loss before the current Supreme Court on antitrust grounds. And one of the justices said, hey, this decision in Flood v. Kuhn, Kurt Flood's Supreme Court decision, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Right. It's ridiculous. So that that's Justice Gorsuch said that. So, you know, it's not out of the realm of possibility that this this court um, could, could say, hey, we screwed this up. It's time for baseball to be like every other business in America and be subject to um, the antitrust laws. But it wasn't in the mindset of a lot of people and certainly those Supreme Court justices at the time, because I think a lot of people saw baseball is a sport. It's, it's something that we do almost. We look at those players and those teams as family. And we, we really don't need to put the word business on baseball. So it really shouldn't necessarily apply. Now, that same kind of mentality, it's, it's interesting to see the, the, uh, <laughs> the interest in baseball and some of the, on, with some of the justices during the, the uh, Kurt Flood case. And I'm talking about, you mentioned in your book, uh, I think one of the justices had a clerk come in and give him notes during some of the, <laughs> oh, here's what's happening in a, ga- a playoff game or something. So he has that going, not yeah, necessarily during I mean, the Flood they're, case, they're... but throughout. <laughs> and, and when it came to writing things about the Flood case, one of the parts, I forget which opinion, the whole first part, he's writing all basically all about baseball history. Yeah. You know, the problem with these cases, Mark, is that like these judges want to show the world that they're baseball fans and their baseball fandom gets in the way uh, of um, the legal analysis. And and you're right. The, the person assigned um, the Flood v. Coon case, which almost went the other way, by the way. It almost turned out the other way because in their in their private conference and their secret vote, the justices um, were were divided on this case and some weird things happen. But the case ends up being assigned to Harry Blackman, the author of Roe versus Wade. And Blackman's a huge baseball fan. He's from Minnesota. He grew up rooting for the St. Paul Saints um, as a kid, a minor league team. And now he's he, he was a big fan of the Minnesota Twins and Blackman. Show, decides to show the world what a huge baseball fan he is by writing an ode to baseball. And his obsession in this Flood v. Coon opinion is with this list of baseball greats 
that he compiles and you have other justices suggesting names of baseball greats instead of thinking about like, hey, did we get the law right here? Right. Are we interpreting the Sherman Act the right way here or not? And that kind of gets lost in the shuffle, you know, with the, this sort of history and sort of mythology of the game of baseball. And that's a challenge with these sports cases is not treating them like any other business. And I, I think to the Supreme Court's credit last year, Mark, in the NCAA case, um, a lot of that kind of mythology about, you know, the rah-rah of college athletics, that was absent from the Supreme Court courtroom. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in 2021, it was really refreshing to see, right? All nine of the justices were not buying into this, you know, you know, you know, idea of, of college sports as just a extracurricular activity and not a big business, just like just like baseball is. So, you know, it's a problem. It's a problem when judges get sports cases, um, you know, male, female, they want to they want to show their fans, too. And it gets in the way uh, of the law. Well, it got in the way of justice here. You know, and I think the thing we've we've cut, we've sort of danced around is Kurt Flood lost, right? He lost five to three. Yeah. The, the, the court reaffirmed its antitrust exemption, you know, and Kurt was really bitter about that loss. By at that point, he had tried and failed to make a comeback with the Washington Senators right in 1971 season. He got desperate for money and to play again. And, and he lasted just a couple of weeks with the team. And, and he basically exiled himself to Mallorca, Spain. So when the decision came down, he was in Mallorca, Spain. He had financial issues. He had alcohol issues. Um, but but people say, well, why is Kurt Flood's lawsuit such a big deal? Because he lost, right? He wasn't baseball's first free agent. And, and the trivia question is, well, who was? Well, it was really Catfish Hunter, right? Because um, two years later, Catfish Hunter becomes baseball's first free agent because Charlie Finley breaches his contract by not setting up an annuity for him as the contract stated and an arbitrator declared Hunter Baseball's first free agent. But here's what Kurt Flood's lawsuit did for the players at the time. The owner's argument throughout the litigation was this is a labor issue, not an antitrust issue. We can work this out at the bargaining table. Just let us sit down and negotiate. Well, the collective bargaining agreement was up in 1970 while Kurt's trial was going on. So the owners were forced to put their money where their mouth is. And they gave the, the, the players two huge, two huge um, things. One was grievance arbitration. And I know that doesn't sound like anything um, m much at all, but what a grievance arbitration did was it allowed the players to bring any grievances before a neutral arbitrator. Because before that, they had to bring all their grievances to the commissioner. And the commissioner was not neutral, but we couldn't work for the owners. That's huge. And they got before a neutral arbitrator in the Catfish Hunter case. And Catfish Hunter was declared a free agent. The following year, two players said, oh, you'll own us for this year and next year, too. But we're not signing new contracts. We're going to play out that second year of our contract and try to become free agents. And an independent arbitrator, Peter Seitz, declared Andy Messersmith and Dave McNally free agents. And after that, free agency was born because the reserve clause was dead. So it was through some of these things. The other thing they got out of that 1970 collective bargaining agreement was something that at the time was called the Kurt Flood rule, which still exists today, Mark. It's, it's the 10 and five rule, which is if you have 10 years of major league service time and five with the same team, you can veto any trade, right? So like th there are a couple of examples. I, I grew up an Oriole fan. Um, Adam Jones, when he was on the Orioles, um, the Orioles wanted to trade him as they were trying to um, rebuild. And Adam Jones said, sorry, you can't. I've got 10 years of major league service time and five years of you guys know. And the same thing with Max Scherzer last year with the Nationals. He had veto power over where he traded. This oh, affects yeah. every this Kurt Flood rule affects every player today. And by under that rule, Kurt Flood wouldn't have been able to be traded from the Cardinals to the Phillies, right? Because he could have vetoed the trade. So th this, this rule still gets invoked. Um, so it was really important. The, the Kurt Flood lawsuit really accelerated 
the, the um, empowerment of the players and change the status quo, even though he lost. It, it changed the status quo um, and moved it more in the direction of the players uh, and, and away from the owners in terms of power. And, and that's when um, the Major League Baseball Players Association with grievance arbitration, with um, the 10 and 5 rule. And then in 1973, they got salary arbitration. These were all bit by bit. They started to get things that are still in the game today that, that have empowered the players. Well, I guess you can look at what Marvin Miller and Kurt Flood and the MLBPA did was putting that first chink in the armor. You know, uh, Marvin Miller told him up front, we're not going to win this. It's not going to happen. <laughs> you got Goldberg, who, who in his oral argument, might as well deep six the whole thing right there. But whatever the cause, you know, that's what happened. It, but it took those first chinks before anything else could have come a free agency. Uh, I know looking back, I'll just casually mention, what was it, Don Drysdale and Sandy Koufax? <laughs> Basically, before there was a union, the two guys said the Dodgers, I guess, what? We're not coming back unless you you work with us. Well, they wound up having to come to come out and do something separately. But it, because of everything that Kurt Flood did, all of those other cases still made some changes. The players today are benefiting from it. One thing I really liked too, Brad, was that Marvin Miller, they say what you talked about, Marvin Miller during the spring training camps, he would always address these teams. He'd go out and visit each one of them, and he would start with talking about everything you have today comes from Kurt Flood. And he's talking to, to some players who have no idea who Kurt Flood is. But his his uh, while he was doing that, and Kurt Flood, you know, was floundering through personal issues, but certainly with financial issues, nothing was really coming up his way. He was winding up what uh, getting a loan or for his two World Series rings, which those yeah. people were kind enough later on to, to get give those back to him when somebody said some, hey, can you help him out? But there wasn't a whole lot being helped out for Kurt Flood after that. Uh, the good news is I'd like you to talk a little bit about it, where it looked so dim for him after this. The last part of years of his life, they, they kind of rose up. I mean, there were things happening. It, tell me a little bit more about that. Sure. In, in 94, a few things happened to Kurt that were um, just kind of great for him. You know, he'd spent years battling alcoholism and, and years battling financial problems. Um, and then finally, in, in, in the eighties, he started to pull his life together, and um, he got sober. He married the love of his life, an actress, Judy Pace, um, who, who was in the movie Brian Song, um, about about Gail Sayers, um, and, and a bunch of other things. Peyton plays the television show, and b- a bunch of other other things. But you know, so he finds personal happiness with Judy Pace. But then I think in ninety four, the world starts to recognize just what. Kurt has done and, and the sacrifices he'd made for the game of baseball. Of course, that was the year of the 1994 baseball strike and the um, players union um, were, had a meeting down in Atlanta. And, um, I, you know, David Cohn talked about this recently and, and um, Kurt, um, they brought Kurt in, they flew Kurt in to the meeting and the players gave him a standing ovation. And that was really the first time that the union really publicly recognized what Kurt had done in, in, a, in a huge way. And, and and that's when Kurt really got on my radar screen in 94. I was a cub reporter with the Baltimore Sun. And I said, wow, like, look at this. You know, the, the, the union is, is, is you know, Kurt Flood is this rallying point during during the baseball strike. And, and um, you know, the other great thing that happened in 94 was Ken Burns' baseball document. Yeah. And Burns did some wonderful interviews with Kurt. And Kurt, as you sort of alluded to earlier, Mark, is so smart. Right. He's so intelligent and he's got so much charisma on the screen. And he, his interviews were really captivating during that um, baseball documentary, which at times could be a little bit long and ponderous. <laughs> and, I'll, I'll, and, and, and Kurt really was like a breath of fresh air on that yeah. documentary. And, and, um, and I think a lot of people didn't know who Kurt Flood was until they saw him on that Ken Burns documentary. And then, you know, when the documentary comes out, Kurt Flood and, and Judy Pace, they go to the White House and, and are celebrated by maybe meet President Miss Clinton. And I, I, you know, this is where I think Kurt starts to get his just due. Yeah. And, and, and then, you know, sadly, he dies of throat cancer a few years later. But at the very least, he got the recognition 
before he died, right? Because a lot of people like Kurt don't get the recognition until after um, they, they die. I would say one more thing, Mark, which is, you know, I was shocked and it almost took my breath away when Garrett Cole signed this huge, you know, 100, 200 million. I don't even know how much money it was. It's hundreds of millions of dollars to sign with the New York Yankees. And he gets up at that press conference and he starts and he says, I'd like to start by thanking Kurt Flood. I mean, that took my breath away, right? That a player 50 years removed from Kurt's lawsuit and people ask him, Garrett, like, where did you, where did this come from? He said, well, when I was coming up with the Pirates, John Buck, the catcher, made me write a book report on Kurt Flood and the Union. But it was a wonderful thing Garrett Cole did because by doing that, Garrett Cole signaled to every other player in the game, you should be thankful to Kurt Flood, what he's done for all of us, right? And that was a major moment, you know, and, and I just think, you know, it, it brings kind of chills just thinking about it, right? That here is a someone who had no connection to Kurt whatsoever. And and he, the first, at the opening of his press conference, saying, you know, I'd like to thank Kurt Flood for all this. Not my parents, not my coaches, you know, not my teammates, Kurt Flood. It was remarkable. So I, I think, you know, that's still going to resonate. You know, I, and I, I, we brought up names like Colin Kaepernick is one. You know, he, he quit the game. He, he, he quit the game to fight for what he stands for. The other person, um, Pat Tillman, right, um, left a, a big contract with the Arizona Cardinals fight in Iraq and lost his life, right? These are the types of people, people who are doing things for causes, that are bigger than themselves, who I think um, are, are like Kurt Flood. And, and so, you know, th this kind of activism or this kind of even altruism, right, it, it still exists. You still see athletes from time to time take heroic stands, um, whether it's for their country or for a cause that, that's bigger than the game. And I think Kurt did that, right? Kurt, Kurt took on a cause that everyone can relate to, that, you know, we should have the economic freedom to work for whomever we want. We shouldn't be forced to work for a specific employer. Wow. Wow. We're talking with Brad Snyder, author of A Well-Paid Slave. And Brad, you, you hit it right all the way home with that. And like you, I saw Gary Coe just kind of knocked me down. But it's his his life, it was it was good to see him back with the love of his life toward the end, to see him get the, that recognition. I'd love to have more time with you, man. There's so much more about him and his life. Is there any other pivotal moments or anything that you think we should address? Well, I think there's two. Uh, I, I mean, one, um, I'd say the guardian angel of the book was Jackie Robinson, right? And I think there's a real parallel between Kurt Flood and Jackie Robinson. And, you know, Jackie Robinson fought for racial justice, um, you know, in baseball and Kurt fought for economic justice. And I thought the big moment of the book, at least for me, was when um, Jackie Robinson, at the end of his life, um, blind and suffering from diabetes, um, you know, comes into the courtroom to testify on Kurt's behalf. And he and Kurt's in a lot of distress at this point. And he comes and he whispers, before he goes up to the bench, he whispers in Kurt, Kurt's ear, hang in there, you're doing the right thing. And Kurt knew that meant everything to him. And I, I, you can draw just a line from Jackie Robinson to Kurt Flood all the way I said it before to LeBron James. And I know it was unpopular, but LeBron James's decision, that press conference when he said, I'm taking my talents to South Beach, that's a product of Kurt Flood empowering players, right? And it may have been an unpopular thing to do, but it just showed how far players had come in terms of their rights to be able to hold a, a press conference on ESPN and change an entire fate of elite sports league by saying, hey, I'm taking my talents to a different team. I don't have to be traded from, from Team X to Team Y, right? And, and I think LeBron James is sort of the culmination of someone who has both Kurt's social justice aspect, but also the economic empowerment to play for the teams that he wants to play for. And James went, then went back to Cleveland, won a title, became a hero in his hometown, and now he's in L.A. because he wants to be in L.A. I mean, I just... James's journey is a product of everything Kurt fought for. Well, and that's it. We're seeing so much which came from that. We look all the way back to 1922, Oliver Wendell Holmes. We're looking at all the challenges that came in between. We're looking at Kurt Flood, you know, almost 50 years ago. And 
the the failure to succeed in the Supreme Court, but making that first, like it's a chink in the armor. And today, you know, not just baseball players, but like you're saying, LeBron James, et cetera, who are benefiting from the hard work that Kurt Flood, Marvin Miller, and the commitment they had to go through with this. It would have been so easy. And when I'm reading this book, I'm thinking, it's so easy at any point to say, okay, okay, I can't do this anymore. I'm done with it. But he stayed with it through some some very intense, some very hurtful times. And Brad, I, I, I want to say thank you again. You do so much with this book. You've captured my attention with it. I I didn't know enough about the final years of Kurt Flood, and you, I read it almost as a mystery toward the end because I wanted to know. I, you captured me with everything about the story of Kurt Flood, everything that he did in his life, all the things that are swirling around him, and I wish we had time to talk about so much more. Any reader who hasn't read it yet should, and we're talking again with Brad Snyder, a well-paid slave. As he's the author of that. Any other final words? Well, no, I just, I hope that, um, you know, people sort of realize now that uh, one of the things that, that, that sort of made me sad about the whole thing was the sort of exclusion of Marvin Miller for the hall of fame. And, yeah. and I know the hall of fame is a kind of a tricky um, topic and, and I'm not advocating for Kurt for the hall of fame, but I, I think he needs to be recognized in some way. Right. And, um, you know, I'm not saying he has to be admitted to the Hall of Fame, but, you know, I, I think that um, for too long, the Hall of Fame um, has been kind of a management driven organization. Bowie Kuhn immediately got in, Bud Selig got immediately got yeah. in, but they waited till a- they waited till after um, Marvin Miller had died to admit Marvin Miller. And I, I just think that there needs to be a recognition for the contributions that Marvin Miller and Kurt Flood have made to the base- game of baseball. And I hope there are more players like Garrett Cole who continue to do that. And I, I think um, one of the things that the union has lost since Miller has been a part of it and since Don Fear has been a part of it is there needs to be more education of today's athletes. We shouldn't we shouldn't um, expect those athletes to know what Kurt Flood did. Um, it's on the unions and their representatives and their their union heads to rep- to, to educate the players about who has come before them. You know, we shouldn't just celebrate Jackie Robinson. It'd be great to have a Kurt Flood day in Major League <laughs> Baseball, right? True, true. Wouldn't it, right? It'd be great to have a Kurt Flood day in Major League Baseball. I just um, I, I just wish there were sort of more recognition. Uh, and it doesn't have to come from the Hall of Fame. It could come from anywhere. But, um, you know, I, I think the player, it would empower the players to know um, how they got to where they are today. No doubt, no doubt. So again, thank you for that book. But you're you're working on something else right now too. What is this? Uh, Democratic justice. Yeah. 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 So I I really, as part of this Kurt Flood book, got really interested in how the Supreme Court decides cases, in the role of the Supreme Court in our society. What role should the Supreme Court play in our democracy? Right. And I really took a deep dive in the justices' papers for this Kurt Flood book on how they decided his case, and, and that sent me on a whole new career path into you know writing about Supreme Court history and becoming a law professor. And, and uh, I, I wrote a biography of Justice Felix Frankfurter, um, who um, really was somebody during the height of the Warren Court saying, look, the Supreme Court needs to take less of a role in our democracy. It needs to leave the lawmaking um, to, to the Congress and to the president, and, and, and that less is more out of the Supreme Court, right? And, and, and that's an interesting thing to say. Um, at this point in time. And so, you know, his (laughs) message, both to liberals and conservatives, um, was don't look to the Supreme Court to solve all your problems. Uh, And he had a fascinating life. He knew every U.S. president almost from Theodore Roosevelt to Lyndon Johnson, and he he worked with them all. Um, You know, so, I mean, this was somebody who knew government. And um, it's really a story of kind of 20th century American democracy and, and the role of the Supreme Court in that democracy. So I appreciate the opportunity, Mark. To, it's coming out in August, so I'm, I'm putting the finishing touches on it now, and and it's exciting. And and he's got a, a just an interesting story too. Um, like Kurt, is kind of an underdog story. I, I'm a sucker for underdog stories. <laughs> well, so, I'm looking forward so, uh, to it. And that's that's thanks, in August, thanks. and I, I, and that's in August, and I'll, Dude, I'll be downloading it to my Kindle when it comes. Thanks, Great. Mark. Again, we're talking with Brad Snyder. He is a professor at Georgetown Law, and I love that one of the things he covers is sports law. 
and I'd love to have been in one of his classes. Brad, again, thank you so much, my friend. We are really glad to have you here on Baseball Biz and hopefully talk with you again sometime in the future. I love it, Mark. It was a, The pleasure was all mine. Thank you so much for having me on. All right. You've been listening to Baseball Biz. As always, you can find us on your favorite podcast directory, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and more. Thanks again. And remember, you can also check us out on Twitter at the baseball biz. Take care and have a great week. Special thanks to X Take RUX for the music rocking forward. <laughs>